All this is Dr. Mohbeen Sayed from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. So today's talk is important. It is about the uh, production of antibodies or the protection developed after a vaccine or even an infection where the side effects or the symptoms are not seen. So this has been a very, very common question for me. Uh, people have asked that through Twitter, to, through text messages, emails, comments here that I did not develop symptoms after my vaccine, am I protected? So we have the answer to that with a study. I promise to keep this uh, video short and you can help by sharing this because this is a question for a lot of people. So let's start our discussion and I'm gonna try to fly through this. So this is drbean.com. You can get your CMEs and CEs for the talks that you hear over here. This is the study. This study is done by Amanda K. Deeds and Xiaoming Xiao and A. All, let's say. And this is done in John Hopkins hospital system. So let's look at the PDF. This is the PDF, almost the same as is the study on the page. And I'm going to illustrate that. So here is a summary of the study, and I'm going to present the summary in two ways. One is this written card, and the other one is the visual. So whichever way uh, it works for you, here are the takeaways by the study, the results. Number one, regardless of the symptoms, regardless of the symptoms, 99.9% .9 of the people who were vaccinated, you could um, you could extrapolate that to infect infected as well. People who were vaccinated, 99.9% .9 of the people, regardless of the symptoms, did develop neutralizing antibodies against the spike protein. So they developed IgG against the spike protein. So that is the most important news and that is it. That's the discussion for today. Second thing that they found was that clinically significant symptoms, that is fatigue, chills, fever, 5% only had clinically significant symptoms after the first dose. So that means 95% did not have. And keep in mind once again that eventually 99.9% .9 people developed significant and robust immune response regardless of the symptoms. 43% had clinically significant symptoms, the fever, chill, chills, and um, fatigue after the second dose. And that actually makes sense because when the first dose is given, the person's immune system is now getting ready. When the second dose is given, immune system is now getting exposed to something it has learned to attack. And so it will attack and that would cause more symptoms. Moderna vaccine caused more symptoms compared to Pfizer. That does not mean Pfizer does not cause symptoms. However, Moderna caused more symptoms compared to Pfizer. And I will keep repeating either case, 99.9% .9 of the people develop robust antibody response. Third important thing, and this is really important. If somebody had prior exposure to SARS-CoV-2. And the definition of the prior exposure was that either they were PCR positive before the 14 days of the second dose, or they had a proof of the antibody titers some, somewhere in the past against SARS-CoV-2. So if they had prior exposure, what they found was that the first dose also created symptoms, clinically significant symptoms. And that actually should tell you, take the first dose of the vaccine and the second dose has more intense symptoms. Or have the infection and the first dose is creating more significant symptoms. Why? Because now the first dose is actually acting as a re-exposure. That is acting as a second exposure. 
So generally, the logic here is that when the immune system becomes re-exposed to the antigen, then it reacts more. So this is it. This is the summary of the uh, study. I'm going to show the same summary in a more visual way. And those of us who like visual, I hope this would help them. So start from the top row here. 14 days after the second dose, regardless of you feeling the symptoms or not, 99.9% .9 of the folks would develop antibodies. So why 99.9%? .9 there was one person who was taking immunosuppressants and that one person did not develop the antibodies. Because of that, there is 99.9%. .9 Otherwise, they would have said 100%. Look at the second row. 5% after the dose one developed symptoms, 5% only. So 52 out of 954, I believe. 43% after the second dose developed symptoms, 407 out of 954. And again, same logic. I'm just repeating what I just discussed before. It's just more visual. Then after Pfizer, there were less clinically significant symptoms. After Moderna, compared to Pfizer, there were more clinically significant symptoms. Interesting. Then prior exposure, the fourth row. Prior exposure to SARS-CoV-2, the odds of clinically significant symptom after the first dose were higher as well. And that is, again, the same logic. If the first dose is given and the second dose is more intense, similarly, if somebody had the infection before and the first dose is now acting as a second dose, and that would be intense. Prior exposure to SARS-CoV-2 or vaccine, second dose, so which is actually now third, there was not much change in symptoms. Do you know what this also means? The booster dose? would not create much change. And uh, we talked about booster yesterday, so I don't want to repeat that. But booster to the same exact antigen as we have experienced before and not adjusted to the newer spike protein changes, that booster doesn't really feel like doing much. And I discussed that in detail that who is it useful for and who not. So don't want to go into that detail. Then another very important thing, generally, clinically significant symptoms, that is once again, fever, chills, and fatigue, was more common in people under 60 years of age, or females, or those who had Moderna, or those who were prior, who had prior exposure to the SARS-CoV-2. Why females? Because Usually, immune system is more robust, more active in women than men in this childbearing age. That is why women get more autoimmune uh, disorders as well. So age less than 60, that means that their immune se system cells are robust and working. They're not senescent. They're not getting older. So they're responding more. Females have a robust system anyways. Moderna is observed to be more intense. And prior exposure causes the second exposure, that may be the first dose, to be more intense. Very interesting. Now some details. Not too much. There is not too much in the study, but some details. Number one, it is a longitudinal cohort study. And there is a weakness in this study, and that is they ask, the people who have had second dose and have are past the 14 days of the second dose and then they're asking them about symptoms that hey what kind of side effects did you have so that means the person is now recalling something that was that occurred a month and a half ago or a month ago a month and a half ago so there is a recall bias it is possible that some of them would say, well, I need to tell them that I had fever or chills. 
And some of them may say, well, I had nothing. So there is a possibility of a recall bias in this one. Secondly, the test that they used, instead of using antibody titers, they use ELISA. And that is a different kind of a test. So still, it is useful test, but it's a different method. What did they do? They had 954 healthcare workers. So poor healthcare workers, they are serving, plus they are part of the uh, studies as well. So 954 healthcare workers were in this study. Their serum sample was collected two weeks after their second dose, or meaning when they were completed in their uh, vaccination. Their IgG was measured using ELISA. Prior infection was defined as positive PCR 14 days before the second dose. So any time before the 14 days after the second dose, I said before, so after. Or IgG titers of 1.23, greater than 1.23. So either the antibodies were present or PCR was positive. And what were clinically significant symptoms? They had fever, chills, and fatigue. And there is one note here. One person who was on immunosuppressants did not develop IgG. So 954. So that, that's it. That's the discussion. Finished. Well, you promised me that you would share it because this is important. I'm going to just summarize it. What is the summary here? The summary is regardless of the symptoms after the infection or the vaccine this study is about the vaccine i am extrapolating it to its infection regardless of the symptoms when the vaccine is given and the full protection is that duration is taken into account then 99.9% almost 100% of the people develop antibodies regardless of the symptoms that is important so that questions which was hey if i did not develop symptoms do i not have the immune response so the answer is here in the form of a study that no you do have an immune response there is another part of this answer which they did not see in this study those folks who respond using t helper 1 pathway and the cytotoxic pathway they are also prepared to respond and control the infection or respond to the vaccine generated antigens, but they also do not have much symptoms. And those who respond primarily with the innate arm and K cells, for example, children, they also tend to have less symptoms. So not just the antibodies, but will they have antibodies? It seems like they would. So that is a discussion. Let's see if there is any <laughs> related question and then we'll stop. So Murha says, any truth to very strong side effects after first vaccine being indicative of prior infection, mRNA, of course. Isn't that interesting? Is this actually possible to extrapolate from this study? Again, people are 954. The setting is healthcare workers. There is a recall bias, but the serum data is not incorrect. And they confirmed the prior infection by PCR and by antibodies. And they're seeing that people who may have more reaction after the first dose may be exposed prior to SARS-CoV-2. That is one of the group. Or they may just have Moderna and not exposed and still have intense response. Or women under 60 may have intense response regardless of their exposure. Or uh, folks who are... Uh, under 60 or women. So all of those groups have more intense response and that group includes SARS-CoV-2 infections, which tells me that SARS-CoV-2 infection, when it occurs, the person does have immunity and when you expose them again, they would respond. So age range, let me very quickly share the age 
range or the data that they have. So if I go here, check this out, uh, Doug. So here, age greater than 60, uh, following dose 1, 1.42. So they have that data available as well. And uh, one can go and check that out. So age, sex, vaccine type, prior exposure, and then they have all this data available as well. Exact range, if I can find for your question. I'll have to check afterwards, or you can check this as well. The link is in the description. Okay, anyways, so good question, Doug. Uh, he says increasing speed, that is good. All right, so let's do this. I'm going to stop here. Shana says, what's your opinion if you were to personally take, get the first jab of Pfizer, considering the Delta variant, would you just wait three weeks to for the second jab or would you wait eight to 12 weeks? So I think about that a lot. I am still more comfortable with a shorter duration just so that I'm not exposed to the uh, virus for a longer period of time with lesser uh, efficacy of my immune system. Steve says, if there's a family who all had no significant vaccine side effects and a few members had real COVID before, but it was very mild, can we extrapolate to say others would also do well if infected? No. So within one family, for example, uh, my friend whose mother passed away, that one family, the rest did not actually have much of an issue, but mother Re reacted very strongly even after getting vaccinated even after being on ivermectin so i still do not have that data or knowledge to say here are the people who will be safe and here are the ones who are not so okay let's do this i'm going to stop here we'll continue our, our chit chat afterwards as well so please do me a favor i intentionally kept it small at 11th minute it was actually over so please like, subscribe, and share Share for sure because this is an important topic. And if you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or you can use PayPal to support this work or you can be a patron. Thank you very much and I'll see you in a few minutes.